بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا ما بعد. Firstly, apologize about the the video quality. I'm uh, in a hotel in Seattle. I'm not at home and just um, using my uh, my laptop. Um, so apologize if there's uh, not the, the the quality that we're accustomed to. Uh, honestly, um, I I didn't prepare anything uh, for this talk, not because I didn't have the time, but because every time I sat down to do it, it got difficult for me to prepare. Uh, so I'm just going to impromptu whatever I'm able to do, and then inshallah, yani, you know, bismillah, leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, <clears throat> I just want to begin by being very, very frank and honest. I'm opening up to the Al-Maghrib crowd in particular that knows me, that knows Sheikh Muhammad, and knows all of us. Um, I'm not going to to pretend or lie that, you know, Sheikh Muhammad and me were the best of friends. He wasn't in the closest circle of mine, and neither was I in the closest circle of his. But we were in the second circle. You know how we all have those, those immediate circles and then we have the second circle. And the reason why me and him weren't in the immediate circle, honestly, is because our minds thought differently. You know, birds of a feather flock together. And I really love Sheikh Muhammad. We were good friends, but we didn't keep in touch on a weekly or monthly basis. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, there's, as I said, there's tears of friendship. And I knew he was there for me and he knew I was there for him. And we would text each other problems and issues that we each had. Um, but in the end of the day, I wasn't of that inner, inner circle that he'd update every few weeks or months and me too with him. And the reason being that subhanAllah, Allah created his mind differently than mine. And even from the Medina days, you know, even when we were together, the, the, the conversations he would have are not my conversations. You know, I am a nerd i am a geeky person who loves you know advanced ilm and talks about abstract issues and wants to make deep dives into you know early islamic theology or the most complex issues and i'm always thinking about those types of things you know and you know sheikh muhammad and his students know this i'm not you know this is the reality we, he, we're all created differently he wasn't interested at all really in the types of stuff you know i'm interested in he he really wasn't interested in that advanced type of Islamic. And he was happy getting a basic background. And his goal was then, how do I take my ummah to a higher level? You know, the concerns he had were different than mine. And the way his mind was thinking is very different than mine. So obviously when you're together, there's only, you know, so much you're going to really go into that deep type of conversations. And frankly, you know, where I was having a conversation with Sheikh Adbar Yahya, he's in Seattle, I'm in Seattle right now. And, you know, we're talking about this last night as well. It's like we were, we were reminiscing about our times in Medina because we were all in the same batch, you know, Sheikh Adbar Yahya, myself, so many of the other, you know, earliest batch of uh, uh, graduates, you know, from the Western world, um, uh, born and raised in America. So we're from that generation. And we were talking about the fact that during our undergraduate years, we all looked at Sheikh Muhammad as kind of being a little bit different than us. You know, like, what is this guy talking about? Bringing in management and, and business and institutions. And, you know, he had these grandiose ideas. And we're 20-year-old kids, right? We're undergraduates in Medina. And he's thinking about, I want to change Medina University and make it better than it is. I want to raise the bar for Al-Azhar. We're just like looking at him, bro, just chill, man. We're, we're just studying, going to class. But the way his mind would think, right? And honestly, at the time, you're like, it does look a little bit weird. You kind of like dismiss this the young kid, like, come on, man, just pass your exams and go back and do whatever you want to do. And as a part of those conversations, right? He began saying, I want to I want to do something in, in the Western world. I want to take this knowledge and I want to take it to, you know, those lands, America and Canada and whatnot. And I remember vividly, you know, that conversation. You know, I remember vividly that he would be talking about this for quite a few, you know, conversations. And at the time, I was very dismissive. Like, what are you talking about, man? You know, people have to come and study with the ulama. People have to be in Medina or in Azhar or in Jama Islami in Malaysia or whatever. You have to come and be in this environment. He goes, no, we need to take this and, and teach our people back home. And he's already thinking along those lines. So even from those early years, and again, I was with him throughout his, you know, um, four years of undergraduate. We were together and then he went back. So he graduated 2000 and came back to uh, uh, to Canada, uh, and I continued on for the master. So we were together for those, uh, sorry, 1999. He graduated 1999, yeah. So we were together for his entire, uh, you know, uh, four years there. And alhamdulillah, we're, we were 
relatively close at the time, simply because honestly, there were so few Western students uh, and so few of them were married and have wives. So if you wanted to have a social life, you had to interact with a small group of students, basically, you know what I'm saying? So Alhamdulillah, I had my wife there, he had his wife there, you know, uh, and, and I have to uh, pause here and make special dua uh, for uh, uh, the wife of Sheikh Muhammad Sharif. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant her sabr and, and give her tawfiq. Uh, subhanAllah, my heart uh, and my wife's heart as well. My, we made lots of dua, we reached out to her as well and just make lots of dua for her and for the family, the kids, you know, mashallah, he has four uh, children, Alhamdulillah. It's a Subhanallah, it's a test that we can only think and imagine about. So our prayers, our du'as, and uh, inshallah, any help as well, inshallah, we'll be seeing what we're going to be doing, you know, for the for the family. Inshallah, that's the haq, the least haq that we have over uh, the family. Uh, but my point being, you know, at the time, he's already thinking about doing something back home. And he would give these grandiose jokes like, you know, hey, bro, um, what do I need to do to hire you from our institute? Like, literally, we're all struggling, poor undergraduate kids, right? We don't have jobs. We don't have careers. And he's already... Hiring people, he's already saying, I, I, I want you to work for me. Like, what are you talking about? You can imagine at the time, it's a bit of a joke amongst us, right? You get my point here. You can imagine we're kind of dismissive of this because his mind is at a totally different wavelength. And it goes to show you really that in your lifetime, you cannot listen to the naysayers. And he would be the one who told us, remember that famous phrase, give your excuses a black eye, right? We we saw it in his own life. Wallahi, we saw it in his own life. Every single time somebody would, you know, poke holes, criticize, whatever, didn't care because he has a vision and goal and he accomplished it, subhanAllah. Imagine if he had listened to the naysayers, one of them, not very harsh, but at the time, one of them being me in the sense, what are you talking about, bro? I literally, what are you talking about? You cannot take ilm to this level and teach it over there. It's not going to work. You can't have an institute, you know, that's going to translate what we have over here, over there. doesn't matter. He had that point in mind. And so, you know, alhamdulillah, we kept in touch. He went back to Maryland and uh, I heard he founded a Maghrib Institute uh, and he came back. He told me about it and, you know, wished him all the best, alhamdulillah. But honestly, I wasn't that enthused. This is 2001, 2000. I wasn't that enthused. Like, it's not really going to be that successful. You can't do what we're doing here and then do it to a Western audience. I didn't have that understanding that is even possible. And then he, you know, um, uh, pitched the idea to me. Like, I want you to join. And I thought long and hard. And uh, he came down to Houston just to talk to me, you know, like entire day trying to convince me. Because, you know, I mean, for those of you who remember the old YQ, remember this is even old, old YQ. This is like 2001, 2002, 2000, oh, 2003. 2003 was when he came down in the summer and he literally spent the day with me trying to convince me to join Al-Maghrib. Because, alhamdulillah, I, I'm not trying to just stop but he really, you know, he did love me a lot and respected me for a lot of stuff. And I respected and loved him a lot. And he really wanted me to come. And he felt I would add great value to Al-Maghrib. He saw in me things that I did not see with my relationship with, with the maghrib at the time. So he literally flew down and he convinced me. He took me out to, to, to you know, nice, fancy see. I still remember that because... Back in the day, we couldn't afford much, you know. So he took me out to a really fancy place, you know, trying like, and he's like, what do you need? What do I need to do to convince you to join? And I thought long and hard and this and that. And in the end, subhanAllah, I emailed him and said, Sheikh Muhammad, I wish you the best. Wallahi, I do. But I just don't see what you're trying to do in line with what I'm trying to do. In other words, I'm still old school. I'm still thinking I need a core student body inside the masjid. You know, we're going to be doing the old school textbooks. We're going to be doing it. I had nothing against Al-Maghrib in 2003. I wish, really did wish him the best. But I thought, that's not me. I need to do it the really traditional way. That's the way to produce Tulab al -ilm. You know, you have to be uh, uh, reading the text in Arabic and, and doing the stuff that needs to be done in a very strict environment. You know, I'm not going to go to, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a paid platform, this and that. And, you know, that type of stuff that even I was kind of hesitant about, you know. And Sheikh Muhammad literally called me up, literally called me up when he got the email, literally called me up. And another half hour conversation, another just keep on okay look give it a try this and that i'm gonna until finally he won me over and i've never had this this i've never said this detail to anybody now that he's moved on subhanallah you know this needs to be recorded for posterity the way he i would call it pestered me the way he was just incessant to get me on board i had to just cave in because of his personality not because i actually believed in al-maghrib and you know what i said to him at the time and again i don't think i've ever said this publicly uh because obviously it's my own you know, uh, lack of vision that he had is a very different vision than he had. You know what I said to him at the time? I said, Sheikh Muhammad, okay, I'll join you, but I don't want Al Maghrib to interfere with, and this is what I exactly said to him, with my real da'wah. Okay, I'll do this because of our relationship, because of our friendship. I'm humoring you. 
that, okay, you know what, Khalas, you really want me to join? Okay, once in a while I'll do that. But And I said to him, I don't want this to interfere with my real da'wah. Because again, my mind is still old school at the time. And like I said in my talk that I gave in my masjid, I owe a lot of my coming out of the old school shell. I owe a lot of it to Sheikh Muhammad Sharif's consi- you know, consistent interactions with me, always trying to cause me to think from another angle or bring up topics that are... And that's what I'm saying. Everybody's created differently. Everybody's created differently. SubhanAllah. Yani the way his mind and the way that he's thinking, it's very different than me. And inshallah, we benefited each other immensely. SubhanAllah. I have text messages from him. He's asking me fiqh questions, aqidah questions. He wants to know that advanced stuff. And I'm the one benefiting from him in globalization and worldview and looking at the globe in a different way and helping the ummah in a different way. So I joined Al-Maghrib uh, 2003, I think it was announced on the forums, 2004. My first class, I think it was late 2004, early 2005, my first class. And slowly but surely, I began to see that what I'm doing with Al-Maghrib is actually far more beneficial for the ummah than what I called my real da'wah. Until finally, I realized this is the real da'wah. This is being able to accomplish what I could never accomplish on my own in my quote unquote old school. And so that's when, you know, um, uh, basically, and he uh, said, you have to do whatever it takes to do. And he made me the dean and whatever. And after that, I became, Al Maghrib became me for 15 years, literally. Yani, I was one of the main voices and personalities of Al Maghrib. And I have. Uh, well, that's one of my best times of my life, alhamdulillah, being with an institute and with people I love. And subhanAllah, nothing but positive memories, nothing but positive memories. I want to share with you some stories um, about uh, Muhammad Sharif, some anecdotes that really, subhanAllah, it, 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 it shows you the way that this person uh, this person thinks. Every time I'd see him, every time I'd visit him in a hotel room, every time I'd go to his you know place, whatever, there'd always be a stack of books, right? And all of those books would be about marketing techniques, business management, you know, uh, PR, this and that. I'm like, bro, you go to any other sheikh's book, you're going to find something to do with aqidah here, some fiqh there. And he's not in that mindset. He wants to figure out how to translate whatever we know, how to make it user-friendly, how to make it accessible to the average person. You know, that type of genius, kind of sort of like, you know, Steve Jobs with Apple and computers. Like you want to make this complex computer. You want to make this something that is so user-friendly. Anybody can do it. And honestly, Muhammad Sharif is like the Steve Jobs of da'wah. Like literally, that's the way I view him. Like, you know, he he understood that our Muslim communities in this world, in this globe, they don't need the type of education we got back in Medina and Al-Azhar. They need something that will boost their iman, draw them close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in order to do that, we're going to have to think outside the box. The amount of criticisms and pressures that he faced. And I went over that in my other khatira and talk, right? When he revolutionized da'wah. And again, anybody above the age of 40, 45, you know what I'm talking about. How was da'wah done in the 90s? In the 80s, I remember. How was halaqa done in the 80s and 90s versus now what is happening? And we owe a lot. Every institute out there in the Western world owes a lot to it. And dare I say, maybe even the Eastern world as well. I mean, I haven't done a study or survey, but he's the first person to come and revolutionize in that manner. And a number of brief anecdotes that uh, I think demonstrate yani, really who Muhammad Sharif really was, subhanAllah. Uh, one time I visited him in his, in his house and um, uh, he had, obviously every student of knowledge, when you go to somebody's house, the first thing you do is look at the library. You go with all the books and whatnot, right? And as every sheikh and student of knowledge knows, you know, you never, ever, ever, you know, give your books to anybody. Your books are your most precious, your most prized asset. You never give your books. Whatever you have, it's like, mashallah. And I'm going through his books, and I came across uh, uh, an original copy of uh, uh, a book that I didn't have, the Maghazi of Al-Waqidi, you know, Al-Waqidi's Maghazi, which was printed, uh, I'm sure it's printed since then, but when I was visiting him, uh, 15, 20, how many years ago, when I was visiting him, that book had run out of print. It was out of print. And it is one of the source books of Sirah, right? The Maghazi uh, 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 of Al-Waqid is one of the source books of Sirah. And he had the original printing. He, you know, he um, uh, he got it the year before I came to Medina. So he was there for one year before me. And he purchased it uh, in the in the Ma'arad um, uh, or in the, the, the bookstore. Uh, and it was no longer there. And I'm like, oh my God, you have this book. Because everybody knew I love the Sirah. You have this book. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. I've been looking at it for years. I haven't found it. You know, I, 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 I'm positively jealous of you. MashaAllah. You know, the way we say this among students. You know what he said to me? He said, take it. And I, I didn't, I thought he's joking. Because no person of knowledge gives 
a rare book to somebody. Oh, no. And I'm telling you from now, guys, now I'm not going to give any of my books to anybody. I'm just telling you from now. But he just said, take it. I said, wait, what? Are you serious? Like, are you serious? You're going to give me a prized edition of one of the most important source books of Sirah and you'll just give it to me? He goes, yeah, take it. You know what he said? He said, I know. I know you're going to benefit from this more than me. So take it. That level of humility, man. And it's true, I did read the book. And I gave a whole sira lecture, you know what I'm saying? That level of humility, man, subhanAllah. That's rare. And every sheikh knows this. Every person who owns books knows this, you know? To say to somebody, I know you're going to read the book and benefit more than me. My God, what level of, of genuine concern and care. And only a person of knowledge who loves books will, will understand that, you know? Uh, another incident I remember, subhanAllah. And again, it shows you the, you know, the... the the love that this brother had, you know, for the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that when Al Maghrib started, we became the most successful, you know, institute. Alhamdulillah, you know, we were we were number one, and I think we remain number one, you know, for uh, the longest time. And then another institute popped up. Okay, another institute popped up, and it began replicating everything we were doing. Everything, you know, is the same types of binders, the same types of marketing, you know, and it was like hurting our sales, you know, our uh, uh, business model. And so we had a, a, a shura meeting, we had a board meeting, you know, all of us senior guys flew in, we have an annual meeting, try to figure out tactics. And this was a major problem in that year. This was a major, what do we do with this other institute, you know, that is hurting our institute in the same cities? There's a number of cities also bringing its, its teachers and doing the same thing, and it's gonna be a business competition. And our business manager, which again, we expect from the, our business manager, he was furious. You know, this is outright, you know, unethical and they're just copying us and they're, you know, they're doing things that we're all Muslims together and they know exactly what, you know, they need to do to hurt us and they're doing this, etc. And he was obviously very angry and legitimately so. And I was silent because obviously, you know, I, I had my own perspective, which I was very happy that Sheikh Muhammad got to this point. But subhanAllah, I'm not in charge of, you know, Muhammad Sharif's president, you know, I'm not in charge of it. It's like, uh, I'm not the one who's going to make the final decision. You know what Muhammad Sharif said? And there are, you know, the people that are in that meeting, they're still alive. They know exactly, you know, what, what he said. He said, subhanAllah, he said, you know, I don't have a problem with Muslims competing with other Muslims if the ummah benefits. And I think that this competition is healthy because more people will come to attend classes. And because the both of us are going to have to raise our bar to attract more students. SubhanAllah. Wallahi, when I heard this, I said, I love that this guy is our leader, our president. This is the guy that needs to be in charge. Because the concern is not the business. The concern is not the institute. The concern is the ummah. And that was my own, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like, taking this as a big deal. Because as well, I also, inshallah, wanted that. But when Muhammad is the president of Al-Maghrib, you know, as the one who's going to have the, the final say. And for him to say this, I said, Alhamdulillah, I am so happy that he's in charge. And I'm, I'm going to be a team player, you know, behind him as long as I live. That spirit of bringing the entire ummah together and wanting to raise the bar. That really shows you, you know, the type of, of, of mentality and person that he was. And, you know, in my entire, you know, 25 plus years of knowing him, actually more than 25, uh, 27 years, subhanAllah, 27 years. In my entire 27 years of associating with him, interacting with him, you know, never once, never once did I hear him say something bad about another Muslim. Not once. He was not of that type at all. And every time you would meet him, the warm smile, the genuine smile that would come, you know, the the, the barely hug that he would give, you know, uh, the du'as that would come, any of these types of things, subhanAllah, you know, you cannot replicate them. And as I said in my in my khatira as well, you know, appreciate those whom you have in your life before it's too late. Because honestly, wallahi, I'll be honest, I did not appreciate Muhammad the way that I should have. Allah, Allah forgive me. I did not realize, I mean, you don't think he's going to leave, you know what I'm saying? And you just don't think you're not going to have a, a contact with him, you know? So, I mean, you don't really... Be, be in touch as much as you should, you know, because because you don't think that it's not going to be possible one day, right? He's your he's your age, isn't it? You know, he's your age, and you you think halas is going to last? And he, we have plenty of years ahead. And um, I looked up the last message that he sent me, and it kind of sent me down a very difficult path because he reached. It was a difficult time because I was getting a lot of um. A lot of flag online as I usually do a lot of stand. And he sent me a text message and he goes, 
if you need to talk to anybody, I'm here for you, bro. If you need to talk to anybody, I'm here for you. That was him. That was him just being behind the scenes and wanting to see you flourish, not take any credit for it, man. Um, another incident, man, there's so many that's just coming back to me. I apologize if it's un... un I, this isn't scripted, brothers or sisters. I don't know. Um, the next day I'm going to say, I'm just saying things that I remember. Um, one, one incident as well, subhanAllah. Some of you attended Ilm Summit, right? Remember our premier program, Ilm Summit, right? We had that so many years, five, six, seven years. I don't know how many years we had it. I remember uh, 2007, I think it was, 2008. Uh, we visited, I visited him in Canada. And I was just like, you know, frustrated at uh, the fact that we don't have higher level classes, you know, like I was frustrated that we're not doing, we're not reaching our, our potential and we should, this, this weekend seminars is great, but we need something, you know, more advanced than this, you know, we need something more advanced than this. So he said, what do you have in mind? I said, man, look, we're the premier institute. We have so many thousands of students. Why don't we have an intensive, you know, uh, two week just retreat where people apply and, you know, they're going to do, uh, so I had a, a preliminary vision of, of Ilm Summit. You know what he said? literally on that dinner table and our business manager is there you know he knows like, on that dinner table he goes khalas it's yours this year you do it i'm like what do you mean he goes khalas whatever resources you need you do it take charge and we'll help you and it'll, it'll be done the the way that he would empower you right then and there like it's your vision go with it and we did it and it was a massive success and we kept on doing it year after year I didn't, I said, I can't, I'm not, I don't know how to, because don't worry, you just, you just do you, and we'll help you from the back, we'll, we'll get it done, whatever advertising, you do you, you get the curriculum, you get the people, and that's what Muhammad Sharif was, you know, he was not a high powered level, you know, alim and technic, no, he was a nation builder, that was his title, he was a behind the scenes mover and shaker, he would see your talents, and he would recognize that maybe those talents in your field are better than his talents, but his talents were better than yours and what he's doing, and he would then empower you, and he would give you the infrastructure and tell you what needs to be done, you know, he taught me what I said uh, about broadening my horizons, about understanding that if we want Islam to flourish in this land, we cannot be that type of old school. You know, he was never sectarian minded. He was never, you know, uh, that type of narrow framework. He wanted the khair for the ummah. And associating with him and being with him, it really impacted me beyond. Like, I didn't realize that at the time. As I said, you don't appreciate the people when they're there in your life. You only look back and you're like, wow, you know, what an impact that he had on me. But subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, we can go on and on. But I think the least, yani, the haqq that he has over us. And inshallah, the sadaqa jariya, you know, all of the institutes will continue for, for a long time. Because I have no doubt in my mind, I have no doubt that much of the da'wah that you see, Allah knows how much of it is linked to how uh, Shaykh Muhammad Sharif revolutionized. Allah knows, yani, it's, it's, it, all of that, inshallah, is in his mizan hasanat. He was a brother, nahsibuhu, yani, kadarik, that he was sincere for the sake of Allah. He didn't want the limelight, you know? You guys knew of me and others more than you knew of him. You know why? Because he empowered us. He put us into the limelight because he realized we have a role to play and he facilitated us to get to that role. He facilitated us to build that infrastructure. Never before in Western history had so many du'at and ulama of different backgrounds come together on one platform. That's what made Al-Maghrib so strong. You know what was the glue that we needed? We needed Muhammad Sharif. You know what was that mover and shaker uh, under whom we could all cooperate and come on, on together? It was the visionary known as Muhammad Sharif. And I cannot imagine that happening without somebody like him. He touched out, he touched every one of us and reached out to every one of us and he saw talents in every one of us and he realized that when we pooled our talents together, what we would get is greater than the sum of the total. That's what Muhammad Sharif was, the visionary, truly the visionary, that we now appreciate and understand. And I, I don't want to say any more because I, I think enough, inshallah, has been said. And, and just we ask Allah for, for, for maghfirah. We ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to raise his ranks, to forgive his sins. We ask Allah for our, our own, forgive our own shortcomings as well. And one thing that has really caused me to do as well is to reanalyze a lot of friends in my life and a lot of people in my life and to make sure that uh, we're in touch with them. I reached out to a lot of uh, friends uh, um, and colleagues from the old school, you know, from back in my day, and just make sure that we're in touch because the suddenness um, of his demise is what really shook so many of us, just subhanAllah, just like that. And it's a wake-up call that uh, death is not something that is predictable. It's a wake-up call that we are all... Uh, everything is already preordained. 
the time comes, you cannot move it up, you cannot move it down. So we just have to prepare for that day, every one of us, and make sure that Allah takes us back when He is happy and pleased with us. We ask Allah to forgive our sins. We ask Allah to conceal our faults from the eyes of others. We ask Allah to exalt our ranks and to forgive our brother Muhammad Sharif and to grant him the best in for those. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him, to grant him, to grant him the best in the Dharain, to grant him the best in the qabr, to make his qabr a vast place, to make his qabr a place of light. We ask Allah Azza wa that he's able to see his place in Jannah from the qabr and the fragrance of Jannah and the smell of Jannah and the lights of Jannah and the, and the visions of Jannah are being shown to him right now. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him peace and sakina in this place of the barzakh. We ask Allah azza wa to give peace to his wife and to his children. We ask Allah azza wa to fill their hearts with sabr and with iman. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow his children to grow up to be shining legacies to the ummah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant sabr to his wife and to make her iman strong and to give her the sweetness of faith, the sweetness that will allow her to overcome the difficulties of this dunya. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all the good that Muhammad Sharif has done and to forgive the mistakes that he has done. We ask Allah to exalt his ranks and to resurrect him in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to be reunited with him in Jannat wa Firdaus Al-A'la. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal for every good of this world that we seek refuge from every evil of this world. Wazakumullahu khairan brothers and sisters.